If both science and faith are ways to discover truth, how do they fit together? Today on Creation Magazine Live, how both science and faith lead us to the truth about God and His creation. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. Today we're going to tackle a subject, um, it seems like everybody has an opinion on this subject. They do, yes. Yeah, and it's the, uh, the relationship between faith and science. How does that fit together? I mean, there are more books written on this topic than you can probably, you know, shake your fist at it. This is just, everybody seems to have an opinion on this. So, so we're going right. to try to figure it out today. Now, ultimately, it's a discussion about how uh, about truth that encompasses how we understand the, the nature and history of the universe, our place right. in it, big questions about you know, what, what our goals in life ought to be and, and so on. Right. Now the creation evolution issue, of course, that's one of the main battlegrounds, right, for trying to answer this, this question yes, about how is. religion and science uh, fit together. And so um, you know, we're told that evolution at science, right, and we're told that creation is a religious idea. It's just, it's just faith. So, I mean, if, if science is um, supposed to be based on something you see, et cetera, how, how, how do we work all this out? Right, and we could, we could define those terms a little bit further. Uh, science, of course, involves observations and repeatability. Right. You observe something in the present, you can do an experiment uh, repeatedly, you can do it over and over again, and get, you same get results. technology. And, yeah. Yes, and faith is a belief about things that cannot be observed. So you have, they're, they're very different, science and faith. Right. In so, fact, if we turn to scripture, we look at uh, what Hebrews, Hebrew, the, the famous faith chapter, Hebrews right. 11 says about faith, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right. Again, very, very different than science. So then we could actually use these definitions to compare creation and evolution, right? That's right. So if, if, if one is science and one is faith and one's observed and one's not observed, well, let, let's look, look into that here. So uh, let's start with, um, with creation. Um, has it been observed? No. no. Nobody alive today was there when God created. No. Right? So we can't say that. Right. Um, how about repeatable? Is creation repeatable? A one-time event that one happened in the event, past. God so created, yeah. No. Um, how about, um, is it a belief about the past? Well, certainly, right? I believe that God created just like it says in the Bible, and I believe that on faith. Sure. So yeah. let's take a look at evolution. Has it been observed? Nope. Nobody observed ape-like creatures turning into people uh, millions of years ago, right? right. That, that's not a repeatable thing. Um, and so number two, we're already done there, right? You, you couldn't observe that. You can't repeat it in a lab. Um, and is it a belief about the past? Absolutely. Matter of fact, I used to sure. have that belief growing up. I used to believe that ape-like creatures turned into people. I used to believe that dinosaurs lived you know, millions of years ago, et cetera, et cetera. But I believed them on faith because I didn't observe Right, yeah. and, and many of our scientists, I mean, they come from the same background. Many of the guys, the guys that we work with that have PhDs in, in the office, the CMI offices around the world, That's right. they were former evolutionists. That's right. Uh, some of these guys would come up to, our, uh, up to meetings and uh, w with, with the notion of refuting the guys who had PhDs and, and showing them where they were wrong, and, and they, they leave the meeting, they say, oh, well, wait a minute, N never heard that before. And, <laughs> Wow, there's, there's evidence for a, a different way of thinking about the past. Well, the, the biggest thing, of course, is uh, people are mixing up the difference between operational science and historical science. That's really it, right? Yeah. So creation and evolution is not about science versus faith. It's about faith versus faith because it's all about a history. It's not, so you're not really talking about science in the way most people think you're talking about science anyway. That's so right. as soon as they say, well, science is part of the creation and evolution debate, well, it is. What part of science? Right? It's, in, it's interesting that creationists understand that creation is a religious idea. We, we know that it comes from right. the Bible. We're well aware of that. Yes. And it's a shame because oftentimes the conversation just ends because evolutionists pretend that, it, well, it's scientific. Right. It's evolution scientific is scientific. Note. Evolution is scientific. And we're on about science and we're doing science. And uh, you just explain to them, well, okay, like, like the chart you just saw. Yeah. 
Is, science involves observation and repeatability. Is it observable? Well, no. <laughs> nobody was, is it repeatable? No. I, I've said that before in, in, in presentations. You know, I'll say, what, what type of experiment could you set up in a laboratory showing me ape-like creatures turning into people? And actually, one, yeah, one time I, I had a sixth grader stick her hand up, right? And I, I said, yes. And she said, get an ape and wait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and everybody laughed. I thought, well, that's genius. You know, and as she was in the sixth grade, she didn't understand the sophisticated theory of evolution that would say, no, we didn't evolve from apes. There was a common ancestor to both apes and humans. Okay. Yeah. But she didn't understand uh, the scientific method. If that was going to be empirical science, you would have had to make the observation. So that's the difference. Stay tuned. We'll talk more about it. Many people have trouble understanding how animals got to distant places around the world after disembarking from Noah's Ark. While it is quite likely that humans transported some animals in boats, this is not the only explanation available. Somewhat ironically, prominent atheist Richard Dawkins reminds us of another way when he writes, Most islands around the world, even quite remote ones like Ascension Island, have animals. Some of these, for example birds and bats, got there in a way that we can easily understand, without postulating a great deal of luck. But other animals, like lizards, can't fly. We scratch our heads and wonder how they got there. It may seem unsatisfactory to postulate a freak of luck, like a lizard happening to be clinging to a mangrove on the mainland, which breaks off and drifts across the sea. Freakish or not, this kind of luck does happen. There are lizards on oceanic islands. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, now some of you may have already guessed, guessed this. Creation and evolution are very, very similar. Based on the, the, the chart we just went through a minute ago here, they're very, very similar. Uh, they're both beliefs about history. Right. And that's, a, that, that's really a key to really grasping this whole, this whole issue. If we summarize those two histories, if we start with evolution, it looks like this. It starts off with a big bang, cosmic evolution, and then uh, millions of years after that, you have the first living cell arising, or, or, or for, actually first you have geological evolution, you have a hot molten earth and, and, and that type of thing, and then you have chemical evolution life arising from non-life, and then it goes on to biological evolution, yeah. that life gets more and more complex, and then the last stage of evolution, you could call it human evolution, where right. human, that, that gets us up to us. Right. Now, of course, creation, uh, see, it, it, it's similar in the fact that the hist it's all about history, Yes. but yes. the actual history <laughs> is quite different. So for Christians that are trying to blend the two, it, it doesn't work at all. Uh, you know, the Bible says that God creates out of nothing. There's nothing there, and then God creates, He creates time, space, matter, the earth uh, in a period of six days. The Hebrew actually supports that. It was six actual does, days. Yeah. Um, that there was a global flood, um, you know, about 1600 years after the creation. That would have been where all the fossils came from as, as the entire planet was, was covered in water. Uh, what would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in sedimentary layers as, you know, as the continents finally raised up, the waters rush off. What's the physical evidence going to be? Exactly what we find. Right. Uh, and then, you know, you just go through biblical history uh, up to when uh, Christ walked the earth, and uh, you got about 2,000 years later, here we are talking yeah, about okay. it. But so that's, that's incredibly different. It's a very uh, different history. 6,000 year yeah. old history versus uh, what evolutionists are, are claiming. So they're, they're, they're both histories. Yeah. Point number two we can make is both involve making observations and interpretations. So here we have again, we're talking about the blending of, of faith and science. Yeah. And the question we can pose here is which interpretation makes more sense? Right. And to, uh, we'll look at a couple of illustrations. Darwin made a big deal about the island of Madeira. It's about uh, 600 kilometers off the coast of Morocco, off Africa there. Right. And on this island, there are beetles. It, it's, it's very windy most of the time, yep. and there's a lot of beetles that fly around. They have, they have wings, and they get blown off into the sea, and they die. And uh, already back in Darwin's time in the 1800s, there were wingless beetles right. that were the result of mutation or whatever it might be. Right. Uh, the same variety of the wing beetles, there were wingless beetles yep. that don't produce wings that became the dominant population of beetles on the island. Right. And evolutionists since Darwin have hailed that as this is, this, this is best interpreted as evidence for evolution. Right, because it's natural selection, right? I mean, it the, is. The, wind, the beetles with the wings, they, they fly around, the gust of wind hits them, they go out to sea, they get dr they drown, they, they die. The beetles without wings, well, they just, that's no problem at all. They survive, they become more populated. So, yeah, that's what the evolution is saying. This is evidence of evolution. Right. It's evidence for adaptation, it's evidence for natural selection, but it's terrible evidence for evolution because <laughs> the beetles have lost the ability to produce wings. 
Exactly. They're actually going backwards. Which fits biblical history because biblical history says we started and everything was very good. It was perfect and everything's degenerated since then because of the, the curse. So right. uh, they had wings, now they don't have wings. If, if I have arms, my son doesn't have arms and his son doesn't have legs, we're not evolving. Yes. We're devolving, yeah. right? Matter of fact, these mutations that cause the, 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 beetle, the beetle's wings not to grow, I mean, look at the, the human population today. Is this mu mutations evidence for evolution? I mean, there's over, they, as scientists have estimated now, there's over 100 mutations per person today. Could you really extrapolate backwards in time for millions of years? Absolutely not. Because if each generation you get another 100 mutations, then it just keeps going on and on and on. And by the time you, you get to you know, your, your third generation here, everybody's got 300 mutations. What? That doesn't fit because you'd, you'd be degrading. You'd actually be, your fitness level would be decreasing all the time. Because, Absolutely, yeah. Because most mutations are, are, are neutral. But just like if you were to infiltrate a, an Encyclopedia Britannica on, on a piece of software with random changing letters and, and, and bits of information, right. after an, enough time, you'd have meaningless goo, right? Right. The best interpretation for mutations then is that they fit with the Bible. They fit far better with the Bible. You start with everything working properly, no mutations, right. and mutations are blowing away information. Actually, if you have a, have a look at this chart here, Look at that red line there. That's the fitness level, the ability of humans to live and survive. Right. And that doesn't fit with evolution. It should be going up, not down. Because <laughs> things are supposed to get better, more complicated. Right. When fitness gets to zero, you have extinction. But it does fit with the declining lifespans at the time of Noah. Look at that red line there. Right. It fits beautifully with the Bible. It's a great interpretation. With all the responsibilities that most pastors have, it is often too much to ask them to keep up with all the latest science that supports the Bible and creation. The Information Department at CMI reviews the leading evolutionary science publications so that our scientists and speakers are both constantly updated with the latest evolutionist information and able to refute it. Give your pastor a break. Book a CMI speaker into your church for a faith-strengthening Sunday morning message. Visit creation.com to contact your nearest CMI office. In the examples we just talked about, you can see how science and faith sort of come together. Observations, science, and beliefs about the past to sort of validate or invalidate each other. There is right. like sort of a complex dance between the two there. And for more information on both of those, you can go to actually uh, uh, show two and show three. So creation.com slash CML 2-02 and 2-03 for we did whole shows on natural selection and mutations. Right. Now, um, creationists and evolutionists, uh, really the history, they're similar in the fact that they're both beliefs about history, both involve making observations and interpretations, but also both histories are considered sacred and untouchable, regardless of the fact. That's right. Uh, to creationists and evolutionists. I, I remember one time I was meeting a friend of mine at a, at a coffee shop. And I was sitting there and I was working on an article uh, to do with creation and evolution. And this uh, well-dressed gentleman came in. He was a business person. He was, he was about to meet someone there for business, but he, he didn't know who they were. He'd never met them. So he came over and asked me, you know, are you Joe or whatever? And I said, no, no, no. Anyway, he sat down and he was a pleasant guy and we were talking. And, and uh, he said, what do you do? And I was a youth pastor at the time. So I said, I'm a youth pastor. He said, oh, yeah, great. Kept going. He asked me what I was working on. I said, well, I'm working on an article refuting evolution. First thing out of his mouth is demeanor change, everything. Well, what about carbon dating? And I was just taken aback at it. And, yeah. what, what about that? and, yeah. he, and he would just engage me right away. Because see, I said I was a youth pastor. Well, some people are religious, that's no big deal. Didn't bother his worldview. As soon as I said I questioned evolution, boom, he was on me like, you know, it was very interesting, interesting. response. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and certainly the, the, the notion that it's, uh, it, it's untouchable. We're, we're accused of, uh, about that a lot, but we can, and we, we would admit that. I mean, if somebody came up to yeah. us and, and said, well, look, look, guys, here's a section of rock that proves that there never was a global flood. Right. Well, we're not going to accept that. Not at all. Because part of the history that by faith we've, we've accepted says that there was a global flood. Yeah. So no amount of data. We'd say it was mis you're misrepresenting, you're missing, reinterpreting, you know, the evidence could fit with creation. You must have uh, mis interpreted what you're what you're looking at because right. it doesn't fit biblical history that would be our response that's and, right. and of course some viewers at this point are probably saying well wow that's <laughs> you're incredibly narrow-minded right I mean, you, you, but but evolutionists operate in exactly the same way that's regardless right. of the facts they're not going to change their belief for example 
uh, soft tissue and dinosaurs? Yes, evolutionists <laughs> believe their history, their faith position, is that dinosaurs died around 65 million years ago. Right. So regardless of what you find, they don't change that position. That's right. I've had evolutionists in, in uh, presentations and I've shown, shown data like you're seeing right now and they just said, well, there must be some uh, miraculous way that soft tissue could get preserved for 70 million years. And you say, well, do you have any way of validating that? Mm -hmm. No, but it must be true because I believe in the history that's recorded in textbooks. Right. Right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so this, this relates directly to the creation evolution. Uh, issue and the, then faith versus science, how they intersect, all of those things. It does, yeah. Now, there, as a bit of a side note, both beliefs have moral consequences and are the foundation of different worldviews. It doesn't really relate exactly to faith versus science, mm -hmm. but these beliefs have consequences. Ideas yeah. have consequences. You can they see sure that in, in the quotes from, uh, from some evolutionists. For example, Bill Provine said, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tell us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. When I, uh, there's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life. And he actually goes on to say, and no free will for humans either. Yeah. In that yeah. quote. It's a related topic, but you can, yeah. I mean, it's quite shocking what he said there. But right. Everything is meaningless. There's no life after death. That's what evolution means to me. And, and we wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, that's as far as his his worldview. Of course, that's what evolution. Far, as far means. as the morality that 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 <laughs> pops out of an evolutionary worldview. If there's no God, there's no creator, there's no one above humans to set what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Then, you do what you want. Exactly. That's no goal directed different. forces. Yeah. Right. Very different than the morality that comes from creation. In in creation, God sets the rules. Right and wrong are absolutes set by God, not set by people. Yeah. Human life begins in conception and is sacred. That's a, that's, this that's comes right from that worldview. Yeah. Made in the image of God. Love your neighbors yourself. One of the, that's one of the top commandments in the Bible. Every Christian right. knows that. All humans are accountable to God. It's a very, very different morality that comes from God as creator, from that belief. Many people are under the mistaken impression that people from different racial backgrounds have big differences in their DNA instructions. But this is not the case. The entire human race has a remarkably low level of genetic variety. Some biologists have remarked that if you sequence the DNA of two humans on opposite sides of the globe, their DNA would show less variation than that of two chimpanzees on the same mountain in Africa. These discoveries have profound implications. Since the human race has low genetic variety, this means it must have originated fairly recently. Racial groups have not, therefore, evolved independently over long periods of time. These discoveries are consistent with the Bible's version of history, whereby the human population originated from two parents only thousands of years ago, and that the people groups have originated since then. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website creation.com All right, if you just tuned in, we're talking about the relationship between faith and science. Mm -hmm. And specifically, since we're from Creation Ministries International, the, uh, how that plays out in the creation evolution issue. Now, as our speakers travel around the world, there's offices in, in many different countries and so on. As we travel around the world, we encounter uh, seekers, essentially, people yep. In, in churches who've maybe grown up in the faith but don't have answers or are wondering, basically what they're saying is, give me some reasons for putting my faith in Scripture, in right. the accuracy of the Bible. Right. And we encounter that all the time. And, and you hear the same questions, right? You know, how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? We right. see dinosaur bones, so how does that science, that observation we make, fit with the Bible? And where did King get his wife? Did God really create in six days? You know, the, these types of things was, what, what would the evidence for a global flood be? Because that's recorded in the Bible. So we, we hear these questions over and over and over again, really. Yes. Yeah. And, and when we answer those questions, what it does in the, mind of a, in, the, in the mind of a growing Christian, someone who's growing in their faith, is it clears away the hindrances right. to accepting the Bible. Um, now, there's, um, there's, there's, there's challenges before us as, as CMI. Yeah. Um, Dr. Francis Collins is... Um, uh, a well-known scientist, and he's an mm -hmm. American geneticist, best known for the leader of the Human Genome Project. He currently serves as director of the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. He claims to be an evangelical Christian. Right. Uh, in a fairly recent publication, he said this, 
anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps a hundred thousand years ago, long before the Genesis time frame, and originated with a population that numbered something like 10,000, not two individuals. Right, so interesting right here, one thing he's admitted is the Genesis time frame. See, he can recognize what Genesis means. Right. So, as the Bible's plainly written, he's saying, no, 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 science has disproven what the Bible plainly says. Now, he calls himself an evangelical Christian. That creates a challenge because many Christians say, well, oh boy, if a Christian doesn't have to believe what the Bible says, right? Right. That's a challenge. I mean, we can compare that. Again, for Bible believers who are working through, you know, can I, can I trust the Bible and so on, this is yep. where the confusion happens. Look at Genesis 3, verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So there was no other people groups. Yep. Genesis 5, verse 4 says Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Right. So Dr. Collins is wrong. Exactly. It doesn't matter and, what degree he has. It doesn't matter his education level. Yes, and that's the point. Um, for Bible-believing Christians, once you've gotten to that stage where, yes, I have enough evidence that the Bible is true, you're, you're equipped with some basic, you know, you get to that tipping point where, yes, the Bible is the Word of God. Right. This question, you know, this what, what Dr. Collins says versus what the Bible says should really be quite a simple issue. Right. Dr. Collins is wrong. And you say, well, but how can you say well, that? Well, see, there's this awe effect, right? From people like, like this, yes. guy's, this guy's a very brilliant man. We're not questioning his, in, his IQ or his intellectual capacity, right. nothing like that. He probably runs circles around you, you and I in, in certain areas. Absolutely. But theologically, he is incorrect because the Word of God is the Word of God. He knows what the biblical time frame says, and he says it's not accurate. Well, then he's wrong because God is a lot smarter than right. Francis Collins. Somewhere he went off the rails. Yeah. yeah. You know, 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the one who's wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has, God, uh, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I'm sorry, but if you put, put your intellect up against God's, He created your intellect. You lose. Yeah. It's just the way it is. I mean, it, it's interesting, that, but the opposite happens in most Christian circles. Right. When you have God's Word beside man's fallible beliefs about the past, which yeah. is what evolution is, it's a belief about the past, when people try to make them fit, like Dr. Collins and BioLogos, the organization that he's a part of, right. guess which one they usually modify? <laughs> Folks, that's wrong. And I understand how there's a struggle with growing Christians, right? And we meet them all the time. Right. You have growing Christians who are wrestling with, you know, can I trust God's Word? Can I trust God's Word? I mean, you trust it where it talks about Jesus dying for your sins, and then it's a matter of sanctification, of growing in holiness and understanding right. to accepting all of it as God's Word. But in that process, you, you, you run up against things like Francis Collins and so on and, and, yeah. and his statements, and, and it just confuses the whole issue. Right, because the, the, the difficult thing is intellectually, if you think about this, because see, it's, it's the intellectual community that's trying to lead people towards, oh, well, science says this and, and stuff like that, but it's secular interpretations of science. Right. And if you're going to run after stuff like that, where does it stop? Because dead people don't come back to life. Yes. Virgin human females don't give birth, etc. So you're not building on your intellectual cre credibility doing this. More when we come back. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. Well, we're in the, in the news segment here, Creation Magazine Live, and we've got an interesting story, news story today. It's also yes, we do. kind of a sad story, to be honest, and, it, and it's uh, something serious that Christians should really really think about. It is, yeah. This was, uh, was published actually uh, August 29th, 2012 on albertmuller.com, and, uh, and we thought it was great, so we published it, we republished it with his permission on our website. You can see that at creation.com slash atheists in the pulpit, atheists in the pulpit. And uh, Dr. Moeller uh, starts his, his blog this way. It's hard to think of any other profession which is so near to impossible to leave. That is the judgment of Richard Dawkins, perhaps the world's most famous living atheist, as he welcomes unbelieving pastors to join the Clergy Project, a group designed to help unbelieving pastors make their way out of ministry. Apparently, some are not moving out very fast. Dawkins explains that the Clergy Project 
quote, exists to provide a safe haven, a forum where clergy who have lost their faith can meet each other, exchange views, swap problems, counsel, counsel each other for whatever they may have lost, clergy know how to counsel and comfort. Uh, Dawkins says. Dawkins, who once held one of the world's most coveted academic posts, has now reduced himself to addressing small gatherings of atheists and celebrating a motley crew of pastors who have abandoned the faith, even if some have not abandoned their pulpits. Uh, so it, it's, it, again, it sets up a fairly sad, sad uh, result, a sad story here. Yeah. Um, it continues this way. The New York Times Magazine told a story of Jerry DeWitt, uh, once a pastor of De, De Riddler, Louisiana, and later uh, the first graduate of the clergy project. As the story unfolds, DeWitt tells about being a pastor of a Pentecostal church. Uh, what readers will also discover, however, is that is even by the time he assumed the pastorate, DeWitt, quote, espoused a more liber liberal Christianity. Though he never earned a college degree, he educated himself by reading authors such as, get this, Carl Sagan, an atheist astronomer, Joseph Campbell, a prominent uh, a proponent of the mythological. Later, he read Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, key <laughs> figures in the new atheism. By the time he read Dawkins and Hitchens, even weak tea Christianity was becoming hard to follow, he right. says. You know, this is something I, I notice. You know, you, you go to churches and people say, well, you know, Brother Bob, he's, he's just struggling with his faith right now. And, you know, you go over to Brother Bob's house and he's got a stack of National Geographic. He's got the Da Vinci Code sitting on top. He's got a Richard <laughs> right. Dawkins book. And you wonder why he's struggling with his faith. I mean, you know what? The atheists are on the attack. They're out there. They're putting, pumping out literature and stuff like that. Why aren't, if they're, if they're truly Christians, why are they not seeking faith? faith-affirming information. I'm not talking about ignore the evolutionist arguments or the atheistic arguments. I'm saying take them on. There's brilliant Christian uh, philosophers out there like Dr. Moeller is just fantastic. Right. Uh, yes. Rabbi Zacharias. Look at the, the people on staff with Creation Ministries. Uh, you know, uh, Jonathan Surf. I mean, look at the people that could be building your faith. Right. These are people that actually, you know, they, they've turned away. And I'll tell, you all, I'll tell you one thing that all these pastors believe in. All of these people that went from confessing Christian to atheist, they believe in evolution, they believe in millions of years, and they believe you can't take the Bible as plainly written. Yeah. And they, yeah. you know, so, so those things are not from God when, yeah. when you think about it. I mean, as, as we travel around from church to church, I mean, our goal as speakers with, with Creation Ministries is to strengthen the church. Exactly. But in part of that process, I mean, what we're doing, and I, we've talked about this quite a bit, is yeah. we also want to strengthen pastors. Right. Pastors need encouragement too. What an incredibly draining job it is to be a pastor. It is. It, it's yeah. you know, and we so respect our pastors, and I, and I hope uh, the viewing audience does as well. But they need your support, and and they need intellectual support, and that's they one do. of the things that our our ministry does. See you next time. <laughs>